This is uh, Robbie Williams, Sing When You're Winning. And this series came about, why, again, one day, sitting in the house, um, I had a phone call out of the blue from uh, someone called Tom Hinkston. And Tom Hinkston phoned me up and said, are you interested um, in doing uh, an album cover? Well, at the time, there was a real snobbery in the art world between commercial work and artwork. And uh, now that seems to have dissolved. Um, but at the time, if you were a commercial artist, rarely would you ever be able to break into the art world and vice versa. Um, so you had to lay your, your hat where you wanted to be, really. Um, so my immediate reaction was this, to this project was, no, I don't want to do it. Um, and then um, Tom Hingston said to me, well, would it make any difference if I told you who the artist was? And I said, probably not. Um, and then he said, well, it's Robbie Williams. And at that point, Robbie was enormous. Um, he still is pretty big now. Uh, but he was, he was the number one player, really. So I sort of backpedaled quite quickly on that and said, well, maybe I could squeeze it in my schedule somehow or somewhere, um, which I'm kind of glad I did now. Um, so I was brought into um, pitch an idea. Um, the brief that I got for this was incredibly simplistic. Um, they said they wanted to do Robbie as a multiple. Um, they'd obviously seen my work um, at, at various exhibitions. It was shown as part of the Citibank exhibition um, in about 2000, I think it was 2001. Um, and there was a good catalogue produced for that. And the guy, Tom Hingston, had been to this exhibition at the Photographer's Gallery, seen my work at the Photographer's Gallery, uh, liked it, and then thought, at some point, I'm going to use this, this guy. Um, so this is how it came about. Um, Tom Hingston had done a lot of really interesting work before. He'd worked with uh, Grace Jones, Massive Attack, Rolling Stones, Nick Cave, Chemical Brothers, people like that. Um, so he, was, he was, was someone I could immediately look up, find information on, um, and obviously... I quickly realised that he was serious and there was something that could potentially do. So I went to the first pitch. Now, if you're ever getting bored of creating sketchbooks or now blogs or anything like that, and you think to yourself, well, um, I don't know why we have to keep producing these things, this is a really good reason, because when you have to pitch something, you have to do exactly that. I guess now I would probably turn up with an electronic form of presentation, but at the time I turned up with sketchbooks. And I presented my idea for the shoot. I presented 13 ideas for the shoot, um, potential front covers. And there was a big scrap about who was going to do which picture and how this picture was going to use them. And no one would agree on it. And eventually they just turned around and said, right, let's commission him to do the lot. So it went from one picture for the front cover, which wouldn't have been this picture, um, to me being commissioned to do 13 pieces of work. So it's quite a, a massive undertaking. And, and then they, they said to me, well, how long would you need Robbie for? And I said, oh, three days? not really knowing you know, that Robbie's time is billed out per minute, virtually. Um, so no one had ever had him for that sort of period of time. And, and then they, they said to me, well, we, with them, um, we want to um, do this at Wembley Stadium. Can you book Wembley Stadium for us? Uh, you know, I was two years out of college, and suddenly someone's, someone's telling me to book up Wembley Stadium for a shoot. I had no idea how to do this. So at that point, I thought to myself, well, I've, I've got to get an agent. So... I got an agent involved, um, an agent called Mark George, um, and I'll come back to that in a second. So he helped me put this together. The shoot was uh, 30 days in the planning, so that's how long we had to come up with all the ideas, finish off the um, products, um, get all the costumes made, all the props made, decide on all the makeup, decide on the location, get any background images that we needed, um, to brief everyone, to plan out everything from the Winnebago to have his makeup done in um, to the exact positions we were going to be on um, the stadium on the day. Um, I had then three days to shoot it, and then I was given 30 days post-production time um, to turn around those 13 images. So it was a Probably the same as what you get in a term, really. Um, uh, quite an intense period of work. Um, and to do the post-production on this, I worked, I would get up in the morning, I'd go to my computer, and I would stay there. I was in a, in a, bed, uh, in a studio flat um, at the time. I would literally stay in the same room, walk from getting a cup of tea back to the desk, and I, I lived like that for 30 days. I, I barely left the room um, because it, I didn't realise how much work was going to be involved in the post-production of this work. Um, the other thing that this work had to do was it had to fit in a whole multitude of formats that I hadn't thought about because I'd never worked that way before. So you have to think about how is it going to look on a billboard? How do you do that crop across that frame? How is it going to look on a square CD case? Uh, because that's a completely different crop. 
Um, how is it going to look on a book cover when they produce the uh, lyrics? Because that's a different crop again. So they had to work in a whole variety of ways. I mean, of course, I said before. Thankfully, I got my agent to hire out the um, stadium, organise uh, for me um, the best possible people to help me along um, on the actual shoot. So I had my agent on this, which was great, his PA. I had three photographic assistants um, assisting me on this project um, for the three days. I had two stylists who were sorting out all the clothes for him. I had um, hair and makeup. Um, who, actually, there was two people, one doing hair, one other one doing the makeup. Um, I had t Tom Hingston. I had Tom Hingston's assistant. I had a record company rep, and I had um, Robbie Williams' personal agent. Um, and that was just the core people there. So we had loads of people sort of popping in from various different levels all the time, all of which need catering for, all of which need, wanted to have a little bit of your time to talk about the project and undertake it. And you as the photographer, you have ultimate responsibility on these shoots. It's not down to your agent. It's not down to the record company. At the end of the day, what you produce is what they're paying for. So everything rests on your neck. And you can't turn around at the end of the day and say, oh, the computer didn't work or the, the bike didn't turn up or whatever. They're not interested in that. It's your job to control these things. So it's a lot of pressure for when you're doing this type of work. Um, but I was quite naive. So I just all went into it and thought, yeah, I can do this. And I did. So... Um, if you get the opportunity to do something big, then, then give it a go. Try your hardest. But use this time at college, certainly, as a learning ground for doing this. Because I was confident I knew how to create the pictures. And that, for me, was the most important thing. I had a clear vision about what I was going to do. This picture was drawn out as a sketch, exactly as you see it um, on screen now. The problem with this picture, and this picture was the one that, during the shoot, everyone thought this was going to be the front cover for his album. But a picture like this is so... Um, UK based. It's, it wouldn't work um, in Europe simply because if you look at this picture and you thought well we won the football match um, for whatever it was World Cup or whatever it is at the time or we lost or whatever there was a bit of upset um, then it would actually have an impact on the sales of this album just because people would associate this with Britishness. Um, so this was going on the back cover and then it ended up inside um, but to me it was still one of my favourite images I produced from that series. The other thing that I did, um, which was a careful and clever move, um, which at the time I didn't realise how important it was, but I asked for the rights of this work as artwork. So I didn't sign my complete copyright over for the work. Um, I retained it, the rights as an artist, which meant that I could sell a limited edition copies of these prints. Um, and the agreement that we came to was that I could sell 20 prints in this series. Now, the Army series was a series of 10 uh, and that never sold out. So I dropped my second series um, to make my night um, was a series of five. Um, and that completely sold out. So I wanted to have something higher. So to get 20 of this was fantastic. Um, this picture was the most popular one from the series and it sold out within a year. Um, and at the time, these were selling for about two and a half grand each. So um, you can imagine how that can help fund your life and keep you working in a variety of ways. And a lot of the money then I invested back into my work and back into another series of work. 